Hi friends, and welcome to Church at Home on this Thanksgiving Sunday. How good it is to be together. I hope that at some point during this long weekend, you can have some uh, special moments. I've always appreciated how scripture points us towards Thanksgiving. Psalm 95 verse two says, come to God with Thanksgiving. What an encouragement for us today to sing it, to say it, and to share it our heart of thanksgiving. Just before we begin our service, I wanna just take a moment to share a word of thankfulness with you today. I wanna say thank you to our ministry team here at Living Waters Church. We have an awesome team. And I know I'm echoing some of the things and comments that I've recently heard from our congregation. We have a fantastic ministry team here. If you're newer or newer to Living Waters Church, you can, you can find uh, these people on our website. There's names, there's faces, and contact information. But I wanna say how proud I am of our team. A team that uh, has full of character, a team that walks in their calling, and a team that loves our community. We were reminiscing this past week of how now we find ourselves in the seventh month of COVID regulation and realities and our team, I'm so thankful for them, have in so many ways actually reimagined almost every uh, ministry uh, that we find ourselves being able to invite you into this fall. What a great team. I'm so thankful for them and proud to be on the team as well. It was beautiful last Sunday, October 4th, when uh, we recognized in a more formal way uh, the 80th anniversary of Living Waters Church and there as well, able to say thank you to former leadership uh, by way of an interview with Ken and Eunice Gallardi and of course a message from Pastor Doug Smith to good people who we're so thankful for. If you have not, uh, if you do not participate in Church at Home on October 4th, I invite you to, to revisit that because it's, it's truly a day of great thanksgiving. Well, here we are, Church at Home. Uh, how beautiful it will be to sing together, uh, to be able to share with a heart full of thanksgiving and a water baptism of someone from our church. Luke Knight will be uh, leading us in a Bible study or a study from Luke chapter seven as we as a congregation find our way back into the Gospel of Luke series. And then of course, at the end of our service, we'll be able to sing some more and then hear some announcements uh, from Ryan and Ruben as they tell us a little bit about some of the things that are happening this coming week and for the rest of the month. So again, let's sing and let's share together with a heart full of thanksgiving for our God is good and seeks to draw near to us today.
doors fling wide The dead come to life Love is on the move When the Father's in the room Miracles take place The cynical find faith Love is breaking through When the Father's in the room Jericho walls are quaking
Good day. My name is Ken Westorp, and this is my testimony. Even though my family had no affiliation with organized religion, both my youngest sister and myself attended Sunday school and public school, we still had prayer in the morning. Later on, I attended Sunday services with neighborhood family, and for a while, my sister and I regularly participated in recreational Bible study. None of these activities, though, gave me a firm understanding of what God was all about. Nor did I feel a sense of love and devotion towards Jesus Christ. Instead, I viewed organized religion as a more conformity than falls rather than expression of creativity that comes from the soul where imagination thrives. Fast forward to the moment I met my wife Ardita and the stumbling blocks we faced with her devotion towards Christianity and my so-called embedded scientific doctrine. Somehow we managed to agree enough for a relationship, but beneath it all, she hoped that I would one day realize just how great faith can be and that Jesus truly loves us all. I think the biggest obstacle I had towards the notion was the very conservative views of the church she worshiped at. I strongly rejected the idea that men should dominate women and, or that science has no basis. When the opportunity for the church to share a more contemporary view, I felt at last the ability to foster more of an open mind when it came to Jesus. But unfortunately, the conservative leadership did not allow such things to grow. In the last few years, I have sought out a place of welcoming where everyone felt equal and that I would have a voice. That is how I came to volunteer at Night Shift and enroll in Freedom Sessions. Both of these programs have allowed me to grow in values as well as become a much better husband. Then one day, my wife Ardita suggested that I attend a service at Relate Church. And from that moment on, I connected to every word spoken and the words being sung. The same sort of feeling happened when I ventured into Living Waters Church. I felt like I belonged here and that Jesus was working within me. Christ's light replaced the darkness of unfulfillment. My words echoed his expressions of love and forgiveness for all. By no means is my journey complete. I am, per I am perfect now that I have accepted Christ. There is always a moment of doubt and failure that reminds me of my humanity. Being baptized is yet another level in the steep upward climb where one day I will be judged as to my worthiness. Until then, I keep on trying to the best I can. God did not make us good or bad. That is a decision only we can make. And I hope never to stop trying to help others just as Jesus did while on earth. And I'd just like to write a, read a short poem that I entitled Baptismal Waters. Beneath these waters, I transform. Submerged in water, my soul reborn. Wash away my sins as I am redeemed. Let no doubt remain, I have been saved. The sacrifice of Christ has set me free. No longer shall devil influence me. Persuade me and pervert what God intended. Cleanse me of my demons and allow the light in. Immerse me in purity, for I want to be whole. Behold the symbolism of my spiritual rebirth. Baptized in the presence of Jesus the Redeemer, I am at last whole. Thank you. Well, Ken, upon confession of your faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Woo! <laughs> 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 too high in the lowest valley yes i will bless your name yes i will sing for joy when my heart is heavy Glorify the name of all names. The 
nothing can stand against. I choose to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names. That nothing can stand against. I choose to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names. That nothing can stand against. Glorify, glorify the name of all names that nothing can stand against. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy. Luke 7, 20 to 23. John's two disciples found Jesus and said to him, John the Baptist sent us to ask, are you the Messiah we've been expecting or should we keep looking for someone else? At that very time, Jesus cured many people of their diseases, illnesses, and evil spirits, and he restored sight to many who were blind. Then he told John's disciples, go back to John and tell him what you have seen and heard. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised to life, and the good news is being preached to the poor. And tell him, God blesses those who do not turn away because of me. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. If uh, we haven't met before, my name is Luke. I'm on our pastoral team, and I'll be sharing the sermon today. Happy Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving probably looks a little different this year as some of us are away from those that we love, which is always hard, and others of us aren't enjoying our regular traditions because of cancellations and safety restrictions. But I think that I'm ready for Thanksgiving this year, maybe more than ever, and not just because I have a crippling weakness for stuffing. I think I need Thanksgiving more than ever this year because I need gratitude more than ever when it could be so easy this year to become pessimistic or disheartened about life in the pandemic. Even though we all know that Thanksgiving can get a little bit cliche, thankfulness rituals are really healthy and they're profoundly Christian at heart. Before we think that gratitude is just about the power of positive thinking, we should remember how gratitude roots us in the Christian story. And that story goes that God is good and generous, even when the world isn't, and that we're eternally welcome at God's table of abundance. The Bible is shot through with all kinds of invitations for us to give thanks. In fact, you get the feeling that giving thanks to God is not only the right thing for humans to do, but actually good for humans to do. St. Paul, for example, never shuts up about the power of gratitude, whatever our circumstances, pandemic or otherwise. In his letter to the Ephesians, he writes, Give thanks to God the Father at all times and for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Gratitude helps us to settle into where we are rather than daydreaming about where we are not. Gratitude reminds us that we are human beings, not human doings, and to enjoy the simple things. Gratitude reminds us that even if things look dismal, at the very center of our Christian faith is an announcement of good news not bad news, an announcement of a hope and a future 
And for that, we can be thankful and not afraid. So even if Thanksgiving does look different this year, I say bring it on because God knows we need it. Thanking others for their presence in our lives, thanking God for every good gift that we know of or every good gift that we don't know of for that matter, delighting in fall colors, enjoying another slice of apple pie. These are some of the most Christian things that we can do. And so I, for one, am actually gonna enjoy an extra scoop of stuffing this year just to make sure that I'm practicing my faith right. And how fitting that we've celebrated baptism this Thanksgiving. Baptism is where we hear that God assures us that he hasn't flown the coop and that he's tremendously pleased with us as children who he loves dearly. And so in baptism, just like in communion, we're learning to say thank you to God. And in a way, baptism and thankfulness are at the heart of our scripture today as we step back into the Gospel of Luke. As a church, over the past couple of years, uh, we've been reading St. Luke's biography of Jesus, and today we pick it back up. We pick up in the middle of Luke chapter 7. So if you have your Bible, I'd invite you to open it up as, as mine's open before us, and let's find Luke chapter 7 together. I don't know how many dungeons that you visited, but I've seen uh, my fair share. Uh, being a tourist in Europe often means finding yourself in the damp foundations of a castle. And whenever I've found myself in a spot like that, I've wondered what people who lived a hundred years ago or hundreds of years ago would think of us paying good money to cramp into this nasty underground cell and then making our way out through a kitschy gift shop. Well, the scene in Luke 7 begins not in a gift shop, but in a dark dungeon with Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist. And John has been locked up for criticizing the local authorities. John is this prophet. He's a disturber of the peace and his whole confrontational life leads up to this moment. This is the last that we're gonna see and hear from John the Baptist in Luke's gospel as he won't get out of that dungeon alive. This is where John's story ends and Jesus' story really takes over. Luke tells us that from prison, John sends his disciples to ask Jesus if Jesus is the one who will finally bring forgiveness and freedom to his people his people who have been laboring under the thumb of the Roman Empire. Are you the Messiah, the one we've been expecting? Asks John. Apparently, John even himself is a little unclear on exactly what to expect from his mysterious cousin. The passage we heard earlier is Jesus' response. Go back to John and tell him what you have seen and heard. The blind see, the lame walk, those with leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised to life, and the good news is being preached to the poor. And he added, God blesses those who do not turn away because of me. Jesus' answer in Luke chapter 7 is typically Jesus. He doesn't respond with a simple yes or no, but he fleshes out what he's up to on his own terms. John is told, along with the rest of us reading, that Jesus hasn't come to tick people's boxes. Instead, Jesus sends word back to the dungeon saying that yes, God is on the move, as evidenced by the healing and the signs, but that God's movement won't exactly square with people's expectations of what a Messiah should be or what a Messiah should do. And that's part of what Jesus means when he says, blessed are those who don't turn away because of me. 
So if we thought that John the Baptist was a controversial and divisive figure, Jesus warns that he's going to be just as disruptive, maybe more so. Reading the Gospels, uh, you see over and over again that everybody has expectations of Jesus. The same goes today, as we still have assumptions about Jesus, or who God is supposed to be, or what God is supposed to do. Some people think God's job is to validate their perspectives, even if they wouldn't readily admit it. Other people harbor this deep fear that God wants nothing to do with them at all. So just like those people that we read about in the Gospels, Jesus often seems full of surprises to us because of how easily we settle into these patterns of pride and self-assurance or how we settle into these patterns, these ruts of, of despair and self-loathing. Jesus is this disruptive character as he routinely turns the tables on our expectations that we have of him. So the Christian faith emphasizes Jesus so relentlessly because the Bible is crystal clear that Jesus is the person who shows us what God is like. And what we find in the Gospels, like we see here in this example in Luke chapter 7, is that Jesus brings comfort to some people and confrontation to others. That's what this little back and forth between John and Jesus depicts for us. Even though Jesus is eagerly welcomed by many, his message won't go down well with everyone. As others have said, this is because Jesus has this uncanny way of questioning our answers rather than answering our questions. In other words, if we assume Jesus will play by the rules that we make in life, he usually ends up breaking them. Something new is happening through Jesus, and he challenges much of what we bring to the table. Something new is happening, and he challenges what we hold on to for unrealistic control, unhealthy control. So there's a lot in this story for us today. And the question that I'd like to ask as we look at it together is simply, how does Jesus both comfort us and at the same time confront us? Well, first, Jesus and the gospel are deeply comforting, which is, of course, far too weak a word. But comfort is what Jesus brings people throughout the gospel of Luke. The good news is being preached to the poor, says Jesus. Jesus' words to John the Baptist flesh out what we read in Isaiah 40. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. With gentle words, tender and kind, assure Jerusalem that her battles are over. This is in part uh, the good news to the poor from Jesus. The comfort that Jesus brings as we encounter him in the Gospels is multi-layered. He comes preaching that change is in the wind. He comes preaching with a comfort that says God is, God is righting wrongs and is on the hunt for what's been lost. It's a comfort for people who find themselves often on the outside it's a comfort for the impoverished because God is going to do something about exclusion, evil, and injustice. As we read in Luke chapter 1, Jesus comes to give light to those people who are sitting in darkness, even those sitting in the shadow of death. So the gospel of Jesus is a comfort because it means that humanity doesn't have to ask for love. Love has already come asking after us. But for many of us, if we're honest, Jesus' good news for the poor is at times hard to accept because no one interacts with us the way that Jesus does. It's hard to fathom that we don't have to do anything in order for God to pull out a chair and to serve us a meal. 
in human interactions, even deeply loving ones, there's always this element of transaction. Yet Jesus shows us that God doesn't need anything from us, so there's nothing to trade. Christian faith, then, is about accepting that God has a lot more to offer me than I have to offer God. And that's part of what St. Paul means when he said that God has shown his great love for us because while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We hear that in Paul's letter to the Romans. Another way of saying that is that in every relationship that God has, God says, I love you first. So if we feel that we've not got much to show for our lives, if we know we're a mess and desperate for healing and forgiveness, for kindness and restoration, if we're hungry and naked and shameless about our need for God, Jesus arrives with good news for the poor. And for those of us who assume that God wants nothing to do with us, or even that God is more likely to give us a bruise than a bear hug, Jesus preaches the exact opposite. He preached that there is a seat at God's table of abundance with your name on it, with my name on it, with the names of all of our brothers and sisters at that table. Later uh, in Luke's gospel, this, this same sentiment of kindness and comfort uh, is depicted in a beautiful story about how Jesus characteristically interacted uh, with children. When his disciples assumed that Jesus wouldn't waste his time with kids, he fires back at them. He says, let the little children come to me. And my guess is those kids had grubby paws and snotty noses. And none of that stopped Jesus from embracing them as he did so many unsanitary looking people, just like you and me. Trusting Jesus and his gospel is about seeing ourselves as those little children, safe in God's arms, so long as we're willing to reach up and say, help, please. So trusting Jesus is about remembering that, that we can't infect God with our shame or despair. Instead, Jesus always contaminates us with compassion and, and hope. So Jesus and the gospel really are deeply comforting. They are good news to the poor. But Jesus is also confrontational. For some people, Jesus' good news to the poor becomes disruptive because they don't see themselves as impoverished and are quite happy to pretend that they've got more power and status than they really do. They might even be fighting to hold on to that illusion by any means necessary. And those people, Jesus warns, may very well be staring us in the mirror. At times, uh, in the past six months, Dr. Bonnie Henry has reminded me a little bit of Jesus, I'll confess. She's kind and she's clear, but you wouldn't want to get on the wrong side of her because her job is to bring us a reality check and her announcements are serious business. A friend of mine puts it this way, with God we are safe, just not always comfortable. Genuine love, I think, in any relationship will always challenge and change us. And that's what God's love does, too. We meet a number of people in the Gospels to whom Jesus brings a reality check and challenges with change. I've heard someone else put it this way. God loves us so much to take us as we are, but too much to leave us as we are. Some of the people in Luke chapter 7, if you read that chapter, don't listen to Jesus because they don't see their own poverty or pride. In the Gospels, these people tend to come off as immovably cold, overly self-assured, and self-righteous. 
they're certain that they've got things worked out for themselves and for everybody around them. They expect Jesus to answer their questions rather than letting Jesus question their long-standing answers. In the Gospels, these people are inevitably confronted by Jesus. And that's the meaning, really, of Jesus' mysterious little poem that we find later in Luke chapter 7 that seems to say that some people don't listen to John the Baptist and now they're not listening to Jesus. In other words, some people want God to tune into their song rather than them tune in to God's song. So Jesus and his gospel are a double-edged sword. Jesus absolutely answers the question, is God in my corner? To which he answers, yes, there's good news for the poor. But Jesus also asks us the question, are you in God's corner? And we have to answer that question ourselves. Humans sometimes have this awful tendency of objectifying and controlling one another. And sometimes we try and do the same thing with God. But our attempts at objectification and control, they never turn out well for anyone involved. So when do we know that we're doing that? When do we know that we're trying to objectify and control other people? When do we know that we're trying to objectify and control God? When do, we, when do we know that we're really not in God's corner? Well, probably when certainty trumps kindness, when self-assurance overrides self-control, when criticism eclipses compassion, when selfishness dominates a servant heart and our ego tries to overshadow the eternal. There's a lot of unnerving certainty around these days in such an uncertain time. A certainty about who's right, who's truly moral. You could say a certainty about who's got God on their side and who doesn't. But Jesus doesn't come to validate our perspectives or to make our lives just a little bit better or to share some good advice. Jesus turned up and the world turned upside down. So the warning here is this. If we've gotten even a little bit of power in our lives, and if we call ourselves followers of Jesus, we had better ask ourselves how we use that power, or we could find ourselves on the wrong side of God. Christians would do really well these days to ask themselves, Am I on God's side? Just as much as we ask ourselves, is God on my side? How do we do that? How do we ask the question, am I on God's side? Well, we do that by prayer, by sticking with Jesus, by reading the Gospels. We do that by watching Jesus closely. We do that by embodying Jesus' character through the power of his Holy Spirit. We do that by daily being convinced that when we look at Jesus, he shows us what God's like. Jesus says towards the end of Luke chapter 7 that when we do that, wisdom is shown to be right by the lives of those who follow it. Now, I should say that if we're overly concerned about getting on the wrong side of Jesus, the truth is we probably aren't. Uh, there are some people that hear a message like that and, and start to worry. Maybe I'm always on the wrong side of, of God. I'm a deeply flawed parent. I can tell you that. But even I don't waste time scrutinizing all of my one-year-old's mistakes. All I want to do is hear her laugh and watch her grow. So if we're willing to hold open our hearts in humility to God in order to grow, to be changed, to be challenged, we don't need to lose any sleep. Just that posture of humility alone is what aligns us with God's character. 
too much damage, I think, over the years has been done by people saying that we have to always be double checking to see if we're in good standing with God. And please don't hear that message in Jesus' message. As I said earlier, with Jesus, we are safe, just not always comfortable. So if we find ourselves in a moment confronted by Jesus, just like his disciples are often confronted by him, if we find ourselves in an awkward moment confronted by Jesus, we can, we can be rest assured that it's for the good of the creation that he dearly loves. You of me very much included. God blesses those who don't turn away because of me. This, I think, is just the right place to pick up the Gospel of Luke again. Luke's biography of, of Jesus gives us this resolute, compassionate, controversial Jesus who breaks our molds and questions our answers. He's not always the God that the world wants, but he's the God that the world needs. There's a poet named R.S. Thomas, and at the end of one of his poems, he wrote, Christ comes to us in his weakness, but with a sharp song. Today, I think Jesus is still turning up with new sheet music for us. And he offers it to us, he hands it to us, and he asks us to sing. He invites us to quit rooting around in the garbage for scraps and to join the feast at his cross-shaped ta table. The good news is still being shared with the poor. The good news is still being shared with you, with me. Through you, through me, May we this week be honest enough with ourselves and honest enough with God to admit our hunger. May we be humble enough to sing a new song. Thank God for Jesus. And from the whole team here at Living Waters, happy Thanksgiving. Just blood.
Living Waters, thank you for joining us for worship at Church at Home. Before we go today, we want to take time to invite you into community and the wonderful things that are happening throughout the month of October here at Living Waters. The first thing I'd like to invite you to is our Evensong events. On October 18th, October 25th, and November 1st, we're having a new series of Evensong. It's on our strength and help. We would invite every one of you to join us you can sign up at our web, on our website and come and join us on Sunday evenings to be able to worship and pray together. Yeah, and we also have a service for families that is now happening on Saturday evenings at six o'clock in the auditorium at our Fort Langley location. Uh, this is a really great space for families who have kids uh, under grade seven uh, to come and gather uh, and to play games and have activities, to worship together and to learn together. And so we'd love for our families to come and be a part of that on Saturday nights. Uh, if you wanna learn more or to register to be a part of that, you can go to our website and find that uh, under the events tab. We also have something that we're really excited about coming up at the end of the month, uh, and it's called Trunk or Treat. Uh, we all know that this time of year, normally kids are going around their neighborhoods and are busy knocking on doors, uh, but uh, this year it's gonna have to look a little bit different in order for us all to stay safe. And so we're creating a space here in our church parking lot uh, where we're gonna have vehicles set up and decorated and, uh, and people safely handing out candy, uh, uh, dressed up and uh, creating a really uh, festive atmosphere for families to come by and uh, and do some safe trick-or-treating in their vehicles as they drive through and uh, so we're really excited to be able to do that we can invite our neighbors and our friends uh, and classmates whoever that might be to come and do that uh, because many of the people in our lives I know are wondering what they're gonna do uh, for Halloween this year and so if you want to be a part of that you can either attend it and come drive through with your family uh, or you can come and decorate your vehicle and uh, and be a part of, uh, of creating that space uh, for our families to come through. And so we'll be following all the COVID protocols. So it'll be very safe, uh, but it should be a really fun time and a great way for us to serve our communities. So to find out more about that, uh, you can also check out our website. So Living Waters, thank you for joining us today. It's been great to be together at Church at Home. As you go, we pray that God's blessing would go with you, that you would experience his love this week, and that you would have an awesome Thanksgiving. Yeah. God bless. Happy Thanksgiving.